Hi, everybody. So in this lecture, we'll talk about or look into the question of what exactly is a philosopher? Hopefully, you've had some sense for what a philosopher is based upon our last couple of lectures, but we'll delve a little bit deeper and look at some answers provided to us by a couple of philosophers. Uh, again, we'll take a look at Zhuangzi. So if you remember last class, we looked at Zhuangzi's notion that, you know, everybody's living in in a dream that we need to wake up from. And in the excerpt I had to read for today, he asks us to ponder this question about dreaming versus waking life. The excerpt that you read is popularly known as the butterfly dream. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and take a look at this together in our text. This is on page um, 22, 23, right? So, once upon a time, I, Zhuangzi, dreamt there was a butterfly fluttering hither and thither to all intents and purposes a butterfly. I was conscious only of following my fancies as a butterfly and was unconscious of my individuality as a man. Suddenly, I awakened, and there I lay myself again. Now, I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly or whether I am now a butterfly dreaming I am a man. Between a man and a butterfly, there is necessarily a distinction. The transition is called the transformation of material things. What's Songzi talking about? What's he trying to get across here? Well, think about the context from our last discussion, where there was a student that really wanted verification or validation for one of his beliefs. Please tell me that my belief is true. And Zhangzi told him to slow down, slow down. We're all living in a great dream. And now here, he tells us this. Once upon a time, I dreamt I was a butterfly. And I felt conscious that I was a butterfly, right? I had no idea I was Zhangzi, but then I awoke. And there I was again, a man. Now, how do I know that right now I am really a man? And how do I know that I was dreaming that I was a butterfly? How do I know that right now I'm not a butterfly dreaming that I am a man? What's he trying to get across to us? What's, what's Wang Zi trying to get across to his student? Well, think about that question. How do you know that right now as you're watching this video, this is the waking life? How do you know that right now, as you're listening to me talk about the butterfly dream, that this isn't itself just a dream? Take a second, write down a list. How do you know that this, whatever this is, is the waking life? What are things that you, you say to yourself, no, I know this is real, this is the real life, right? I'm awake right now, versus when you think you are dreaming. Usually in class, I have students get together and they come up with a list of things. For instance, you might say, well, because, you know, in the dream world, I can do things that, you know, that I can't normally do in the waking world. What's wrong with that sort of justification? Aren't you assuming that the waking world is real in that sense? How do you know that the real world isn't one where you can do all those crazy things? You might say to yourself, well, I know I'm dreaming because the dream life is fleeting, right? Every dream, every time I go to sleep, I have a dream and they're not connected to one another. There's no continuity there. In the waking life, every time I wake up, I'm back to this life. There's a continuation from one, uh, from one waking moment to the previous one, right? where you wake up and you're back at the same place that you went to sleep at. You woke up and you're back to looking the same way when you look in the mirror, right? There's a continuation. So that's the more real life. What's wrong with that justification? Aren't you making the assumption that the real life is one of continuity, continuity? Who says the real life is one of continuity? Isn't that itself an assumption? Think about any reason you have for believing that this life right now, of you staring at my face <laughs> as we go over this lecture, think about any reason you have for believing that's the real life. Isn't that reason just based on some 
assumption. And isn't that assumption based upon you already assuming that this is the real life? Do you see how that works? So, what's Zhuang Zi trying to get across? What's the point? In some sense, he's showing us what it means to be a philosopher, right? Which goes back to our question for today. Oops, that you can't see because my face is in the way. <laughs> what does it mean to be a philosopher? Hopefully you get the sense from what Zhuang Zi is doing that, you know, it's not just about asking any old question, right? What sorts of questions is he asking about? Okay, so let's move on, take a look at another philosopher that will help us get a sense for this. And this is Plato, right? So we already know Plato to some extent because that's how we know about Socrates. And uh, if you take a look at his time period, 427, 347 BC, one thing to know about, you know, every time we go through philosophers and the dates of their life, um, I'm never going to ask you a question about the dates of their life in an exam. I put this for you just as a reference, so you have a sense for the time period that these people have been around or were around. Uh, Plato, okay? So, Greek philosopher, student of Socrates, in the excerpt you read for today, uh, is contained his famous allegory of the cave. And within that allegory, Plato presents to us what he believes is the path to true knowledge. How do you know you're a butterfly, not dreaming you're a man? How do you know you're a man, not dreaming? Uh, Plato's going to show us or describe to us what he thinks the path to true knowledge is. And by doing that, he's also going to tell us what he thinks it means to be a philosopher. He has a very specific idea of what the role of a philosopher actually is. And it's not just about asking any old question. Okay? So, let's take a look at this reading. Now, I may, should have, I might, uh, I might, I should have mentioned this maybe a little bit earlier in our term, but, you know, we're going to be reading about, or reading things that were written a long time ago in different languages by people that didn't speak like we speak, so it's oftentimes going to be a little bit difficult to understand what some of these philosophers are saying, okay? I mean, just imagine how hard it might be to, to talk to somebody that doesn't know anything about iPhones or computers or their language is going to be different. Our terms of our uh, frame of reference might be a little bit different. So when we read about philosophy from a lot of these philosophers who have died a long time ago, maybe a little tough, okay? But stick with it. Part of being in this class isn't just about the ideas, but it's about getting used to reading philosophy, getting used to how to interpret ideas that, you know, are relatively important because they have formulated a lot of our culture and a lot of how we think in Western society. Okay, so the be better you're able to read them on your own as opposed to having just someone tell you, because who knows whether or not they're accurate, the better chance you have of reading stuff on your own, the better chance you are of gaining the wisdom that these philosophers had. Okay, so let's take a look at Plato's allegory of the cave. So let's begin by thinking about uh, a scenario. Let's imagine you walked into, or let's imagine you were born, and your you were born by the way probably, but let's imagine your parents after your birth placed you into my classroom from birth, and you were chained from birth in a chair in my classroom, all right, facing the, the whiteboard. And for the most part, um, I am mean, and I leave the lights off in the classroom. So you grow up, and most of your life, this is what you see, just darkness. And then every once in a while, I might do a little hand puppet in front of my projector in the classroom, right? And I'll project this onto the whiteboard on, um, you know, on, uh, I'm sorry, I'll project that onto my screen in my classroom. So then you see this. And then every once in a while, you know, I'll turn off the lights I mean, again, turn off the projector, and then maybe every once in a while I'll, I'll do another hand puppet. I might even change it a little bit and do that. Now you grow up and you start to develop, you know, a language. And you hear other people around you, and you as a collective might to the, start to develop your own language about stuff. And uh, you might start to give things names. Like when I do this hand puppet, you go, oh, look, uh, uh, Jerry. There's, there's Jerry again. 
and then it's nothingness, and then oh look, there's Jerry. And there, every time you see this hand puppet, you might have come up with your own term. There's Googly Boop, right? Oh look, Googly Boop is there, and then oh look, Jerry, and then Googly Boop. Well, you start to develop your own language, you start to label things, and you start you might start to see a pattern that every time you see Jerry, Googly Boop follows. And every time you see Googly Boop, you see Jerry. But then one day after you see Googly Boop, you see this thing. You're like, oh, what the heck is that? You don't really know what it is. It's me in the back doing a hand puppet. You have no idea. All you see is this shadow on the screen. And as a collective, you might name it something else like tambourine. Okay, so we go from tambourine to googly boop. And you know that when you see googly boop, you see either tambourine or you see Jerry. Eventually, this is your entire life, right? You go from, I've lost track of names. You go from uh, tambourine to googly boop to Jerry, to darkness for most of the time. And then to Jerry, and then when you go to Jerry, you know it goes to Googly Boop. And from Googly Boop, you know it goes to either back to Jerry or it goes to Tambourine. And this happens all the time. In fact, it's like clockwork. You know this will happen. You know that whenever you see Tambourine, you're going to see Googly Boop. And that when you see Googly Boop, you're either going to see Tambourine or you're going to see Jerry. And it's predictable. And you feel like you understand now reality, right? Because your language has allowed you to describe it in a way that makes sense to you. Kind of like science does for us, right? We have a language that describes the world in a way that makes sense to us. But... How would you describe this sort of experience of reality? Most of your life, or most of the lives of these people that grew up in this classroom, is in darkness. Nothing. And these shadows are all that they see. And when you ask them if they know the world, they go, yeah, I know the world. I know that whenever we see tambourine, we're going to see googly boop. Whenever we see Googly Boop, it's either going to be Tambourine or Jerry. And we see Jerry, it's either going to be Googly Boop or Darkness. See, I know the world. How would you describe that experience of reality? How would you describe that knowing of the world? Maybe limited? Maybe a little bit sad? <laughs> Maybe literally just black and white? Right? This is Plato's allegory. Plato is describing to us what he thinks most of our experience of reality is like. Limited. Right? A little bit too black and white. Not too nuanced. We lack the depth of real knowledge of reality. Just like these slaves within the classroom, Plato gives us the allegory that we are like slaves in a cave. Now, remember his story. He gives us these slaves that, just like our students, are chained to these chairs, staring at this wall of the cave. And all they notice are the shadows on the wall of the cave. Behind them, there's a fire. And every once in a while, people walk in and out of the cave. And because they're walking in and out of the cave, the fire projects their shadows onto the wall. So just like our story about the students in our classroom that are growing up in this room, in that environment, all their lives, same with these prisoners in the cave. And just as we would say, man, that's a limited existence. That's a limited sense of what reality is. That's a limited sense of knowledge. That's a really black and white, really shallow idea of life. Same thing with these prisoners. And Plato says, same thing of us. We go through our lives, says Plato, with a sense that we know reality. We can explain it when, in fact, we don't know anything. 
We only know shadows, projections of reality onto our cave walls or our classroom screen. Plato asks, well, you know what, if you know, one of these people eventually gets up, somehow is able to break free and turns around, what might happen? What if one of these people is able to break free, turns around, and decides to go to the light? Not just to the fire, but to the light that's leading them outside of the cave. What might their experience be like? Imagine that. Imagine you're in the classroom, you grew up, everything's dark, you only know Bezzy Bob, Jerry, Tambourine, and eventually you decide to turn around and you see a projector and you see this dude walking in and out of the classroom. And you see that when he walks out, there's like this light. You might get curious, right? You, just like the prisoner, you might get curious and decide to go outside, venture out, find out what's out there. And what would you experience? What did Plato say? These, these prisoners would experience blinding light. They've never seen this before. They wouldn't be able to see. It, it hurts. So it'd be painful to see what's outside. It'd be painful to escape and to look at what's true beyond your cave. You go outside, it's painful, and then eventually your eyes adjust. And you look around, and eventually you come to a realization that your entire life has been a sham. That this out here is the real world. This, I mean, think about what you'd see if you walked outside the cave, walked outside the classroom. You'd see flowers and trees and people. You'd see color for the first time. And maybe after a while, you're not just overwhelmed by the experience, but you're amazed by it. You're, you've come to the realization that I got, oh my God, this is life. What do you do next? What if you came down? What if you came down and told people, hey, hey, there's stuff happening. How might their responses be? What would they do or say to you? Think about that for a second. Usually in class, it's the point where I have you think about two specific questions concerning this allegory. Now, by the way, uh, when we go through these lectures together in our class videos, whenever I bring up a question like this, where I say, hey, in groups, this is what we often ask in class. These are possible, possible short answer questions for your exams. So you'll be given, I mean, your exam, your midterm and final will be comprised of short answer questions. And I will pick a couple of the ones we go through in class. So this is a possible midterm exam question. First part, According to Plato, what is the duty of a philosopher? What's a philosopher supposed to do? Two, in what ways are many of us like slaves in Plato's cave? Think about that for a second. Think about those two questions. Based on what you read, what is the duty of a philosopher according to Plato? And in what ways are we like slaves in the cave? And I, I want you to think about very specific, practical, pragmatic examples. Okay? So, as you think about these questions and you come up with your answers, you're going to start to get a picture now for what Plato thinks it means to be a philosopher. And it's not just about asking random questions. Now, you might object to this and go, Plato, look, I'm not a slave. I know what's real. This is real. I know that my computer is real. I know that I'm real. I'm not chained at all. Is that necessarily true? I know it feels true that you are a real person watching a real video, whatever real video means. I know you feel that's true. Plato says, no, it's not. Here is an example I'd like you to think about. Uh, it, was a, it was a scenario that became really popular, I think, in the 70s. We'll talk about why in a second. So imagine this scenario. A father and son are in an accident, and the father dies instantly. The son is taken to the hospital. Okay, can you imagine that? 
father and son are in an accident. Maybe they're driving to school. They're in an accident and the father dies instantly. Son is taken to the hospital. The doctor takes one look at him and says, I can't operate on him. He's my son. How is that possible? This scenario became popular, I think, in the 70s, maybe 60s. In the 70s, for sure, people knew about this. Because it seemed impossible. People were stumped by this. Can you think of how this is possible? In this scenario, the doctor was the son's mother. And in the 70s, that was really hard to see, that the doctor was female. And maybe some of you had that difficulty still too, even in you know the 2000s, imagining the doctor as first or primarily being female, right? Because in many ways, we are still stuck in our caves. But maybe you saw that. What if I told you, no, 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 actually, this is not, that's not true. The doctor was the son's other dad. Right? The son had two fathers. For some people, that's an impossible idea. That's not something that they grew up with, thinking of having two dads. Maybe that was your cave. But Plato says... We're all stuck in our caves, seeing only the shadows, not stepping out and venturing to find out what's more to be known. Here's a story about this researcher who went to see pygmies and learn about pygmies. If you're not familiar with pygmies, pygmies are indigenous uh, people that live in dense forests. So he wanted to learn more about them. Uh, he thought it'd be interesting to take one of these pygmies out on a Jeep ride because the pygmy had never experienced being in a jeep before. So one of the pygmies went with the researcher and drove. they drove out from the forests into the fields, into some meadows, right, in some grassy hills. And the pygmy was having a great time, but then he started to get really freaked out. He became really, really scared as they were driving off further and further away. And the researcher's like, oh my God, are we going too fast maybe? Or what's, what, what, are you, what, are you, what are you so scared? And the pygmy goes, don't you see those magical flies? The researcher is looking at the windshield and he's like, magical flies? I don't see any magical flies. What does he mean? No, I, I, Pigman goes, look, look, don't you see those flies that are growing really fast in front of us? Those magical flies? The researcher stares out the windshield. I don't, what, what's he talking about? Magical flies that are growing real fast. I have no idea. What was happening was that the pygmy in the Jeep, right, as he's going away and into the plains, saw a dot on the windshield. And that dot looked like a fly at first because that's how the pygmy grew up. When they see things like that, they are flies. And he noticed that that thing, that dot in the windshield was growing and growing and growing really fast as they were driving. What happened? It turns out that they were driving towards Buffalo. And from far away, the Buffalo look like dots in the windshield. And as they get closer, those dots expand. The pygmy had never been in a Jeep ride before. He'd never experienced what it meant to drive close to something. In his mind, his cave said, magical flies. What's your cave? Do you know people that are, have certain perceptions? have certain ideas about the world? Plato says we all have those. Many people used to think that we were the center of the universe. It was science. Go outside. Everything's revolving around us. Makes complete sense. Some people had a very hard time letting that go and realizing that, that we are not the center where the sun revolves around us. We actually orbit the sun. Lots of people, even today, have a hard time understanding that. Even more people today still believe in this, that the earth is flat. Not too long ago, that was like, that was reasonable to believe because there's evidence for it. What's the evidence? Go outside. Take a look. I don't see a curved earth. It looks flat to me. What's your cave? 
What's your reality? What are your shadows? Here is Henry Warner. Do you know Henry Warner? Does the name Warner mean anything to you? Warner Brothers, the movie studio? When Harry Warner first started making movies, his studio produced you know, silent films. It'd be you know, action, you'd see, and then there'd be a soundtrack, music, right? No dialogue between actors. And that was the norm. That's what everybody did. They, they watched movies that were silent. And when somebody said, hey, why don't we have those actors talk to each other? Warner said, who wants to hear actors talk? The music. That's the big plus about this. Can you see what his cave is? Can you see what his cave was? Plato says we're all stuck in them. Plato says we are all have, in some way, attachment to our shadows. Here's a scenario for you. A man is born in 1990 and dies in 2010. When he died, he was 32 years old. What is this possible? Not thinking about any sort of sci-fi scenario, is this possible? A man is born in 1990 and dies in 2010. When he died, he is 32 years old. On the surface, it seems impossible. If you feel that way, that's your shadow, because this is very possible in a very practical, everyday sort of way that we may talk about in our live lecture this week. But we're caught in our shadows all the time. So a way to think about what philosophers do is philosophers bring to light our beliefs, especially the implicit ones, the ones we're not always conscious of, the ones that are underneath what we do, right? When you say to yourself, hey, how do I know this is, a, a, uh, I'm, a, I'm awake here and, and dreaming there? There's an implicit belief in the reasons you have in your head for why you think you're awake now. So philosophers, what we do is we bring to light those beliefs, those assumptions about ourselves, so who we are, about the world in which we live in, about how it works, what are the assumptions, the implicit beliefs that dictate how we live in this world? What are the implicit beliefs that dictate why we believe certain things are valuable? Why is money more valuable than love? Why is love more valuable than safety? Why is, why is a career more valuable than time with the family? There is an implicit belief in there, an assumption you're making about how life works. Philosophers bring that to light. Going back to Plato's allegory. And maybe most importantly, going back to the original questions we had you reflect upon for your flip grid assignment, you know, what is it that makes life worth living? You have some implicit beliefs about that. When we ask questions, we're asking questions to get to the heart of those assumptions. Is, is, is going to school, getting a job, making money, is that why you live life? Is that what life is for? If that's not really it, when you say it out loud, when you ask yourself out loud, then what is it? When we ask questions, and not just trivially asking questions, philosophers ask questions to get at to the fundamental assumptions about your worldview. How you see the world, how you think it works, how you're supposed to operate in it, how to have a good life. We try, as philosophers, to bring that to light, to go and step outside of our caves, right? Plato says a philosopher doesn't just ask questions, and takes a look at reality and lives there, the philosopher comes back down and asks questions to other people so they can turn around too and escape the cave. But when you ask those questions to people, how might they, what, what, what their, might their response be? If you tell them, hey, there's something more, they might laugh at you. They might go, what are you talking about? You're crazy. This is reality. This is, I know reality. This is it. What you're talking about, that's insane. That's nuts. But Plato says a philosopher is supposed to point people to look outside, right? We are supposed to stick to our guns about questioning assumptions in order to encourage people to escape. Our, our philosophers don't just stand outside in the real world pondering ideas. We're supposed to come back down and help everybody else. And he, Plato, sees this in a very political sense too. That philosophers are supposed to be the ones that govern society. 
that the people that should be governing should be philosophers. They should be lovers of wisdom. They should be people that want to know truth, that want to know reality, that want to question what they believe to be true in order to always get closer to the truth. Take a look at who governs us today. I have no idea when you might be watching this video and who the president might be or the governor of the state might be, but are they philosophers? Do they question their own assumptions or are they out for their own benefit? Are they after you know their own desires and goals? A philosopher, says Plato, isn't after you know, any sort of material possession. A philosopher is out after truth. A philosopher wants to escape and know. Their, their pursuit is of wisdom. Is that who governs us today? Plato says, that's what a philosopher should do. Pursue wisdom and help govern. Uh, what do you think about that? What do you think about that answer for what a philosopher is? Now, we can ask questions about worldviews, right? How are these worldviews formed? Why do some people pursue wealth and power and status over anything else? Why do some people pursue a good, pursue a good job versus more time with the family? Well, worldviews are formed informally. Right? I mean, as you grow up, they just start to be ingrained in you because of who you're around, which means they're often formed uncritically, right? As you watch movies and TV shows, as you listen to mom and dad, and as you, be influ as you are influenced by your family and friends, you don't often question everything. You just, it just comes into you, right? Worldviews are formed intergenerationally, meaning that generation before you is going to pass down some things that they think they know to us, and then we're going to pass it down to... You know, the younger generation, it just happens naturally. Um, it is passed intra-generationally, so within your generation, because you have a shared culture, right? You, you join clubs and associations and are part of groups within your own generation. Um, and then you share and affirm certain views upon life. Um, so, you know, your community helps you form these things. So... I get rid of this thing on the screen for you. Going back to the butterfly dream, what's the point here? Is it really the question if we're dreaming or awake? Maybe. But it's really about questioning fundamental assumptions. Fundamental assumptions that we take for granted. Right? Philosophers, supposedly, according to Zhuang Zi, are meant to question fundamental assumptions that people often overlook in a general sense, right? Remember this excerpt from the previous lecture? There will come a great awakening, and only then shall we know the great dream that all this is. Yet the ignorant are sure that they are awake. Sure as sure can be. This one's a ruler, that one's a shepherd. They're all absolutely certain of it. Plato says, yeah, this is our caves. We think we know who we are. We think we know what we're supposed to do in the world. We think we know what was right, what is wrong. That's our shadows. We're stuck in our caves. We should always be looking behind, questioning, trying to get at truth, trying to get towards more light. Because that's how you're able to see. Remember going back to the whole idea of insight? You need to go towards the light to be able to see things in new ways, in different ways. So what do you think? As long as he's just talking about metaphorically an awakening, is he just talking about how maybe we're unconscious, you know, believing things unconsciously, doing things unconsciously, like we talked about last lecture. I think it's all just metaphor for how psychology tells us that, you know, a lot of what we believe, a lot of what we perceive is just, you know, filtered um, by some sort of bias. Is, is that all that it's reflecting, reflective of? That there is a more real world that exists beyond our normal experience? That there's always a different way of looking at our experience of reality? Plato thinks of this not just metaphorically, right? He's not just saying, hey, look, everybody, because of culture, you're programmed to believe, you know, that you have to be have conservative values or because of who you grew up with and parents, you are conditioned to believe in liberal values. Right. Um, and that's your cave metaphor. No, Plato thinks about this in a more literal sense. Plato believes or his philosophy believes that there is something called a divided line. 
And this refers to how there are two experiences of reality. One is the physical world of our senses. This view, listening to me, looking at a screen. This is this physical world of senses. But that world is always changing. It's always in flux. There's nothing concrete about it, says Plato. This physical world is always evolving. That is the cave. Because if it's always evolving, it's not ultimately true. That's the cave. This is the world of the shadows. All of this. Right? This physical world, not real. What is real is this other world. Right? The other side of the divided line, as I move my face to get out of the, hopefully get out of the way. Okay. This is the invisible world of reason. Right? Plato says that this other world is beyond this physical world. There is a perfect world, a world of absolute perfection beyond this physical world. And in that world, there is no change because it's perfect. Instead of changing, things exist. That is the world of reason. An example of this, we'll talk more about this in, in further this lectures. An example of this is think about mathematics. Right? Numbers aren't physical. But in a very in, for a lot of people, numbers are some of the most real things possible because they don't really change. Those ideas of numbers, like one plus one equals two. It just, it just seems like it just has to be true. There, it doesn't change. Well, where does that exist? Where does that truth exist? That truth doesn't exist in the physical world because you can't touch one plus one. <laughs> it's an idea, right? That's the world of reason. Those ideas are the world not of sensations and physical touching and hearing and smelling. That's the world of the intellect. That's the world of reason. That absolute world is what's actually back behind us in the light. That's the real world. Never changing, exists forever, perfect. Right? You can refer to this as the absolute. The contents of this real world outside the cave is the ideal forms. Meaning all of this experience of reality when we take a look at tables and chairs and uh, computers, we can feel it, touch it, but that's always changing. But the idea of a chair, the idea of a computer, the idea of a table, that's absolute, he says. Because that's how we're able to tell that this table is also a table and that table is also a table and this table is also a table, even though they're different shapes and sizes and different odors to them because you ate different things on them. Even though physically they're different, the idea of table is what they all have in common. And the idea of table isn't physical. It's in the real world outside. That world of reason. Okay. I want you to think about this slowly in general terms. Where else have you heard of the idea that there is a physical world, but then there is a more real world that's not physical. It's immaterial. It's, it's beyond us, but it's perfection, right? It exists forever. It's the ideal world. A lot of this philosophy we see incorporated into a lot of Western ideas, especially those that were influenced by Christianity. Christian theology was heavily influenced by this idea. You know, here is this world of matter, and then there is a spiritual world, this more real world, this perfect world beyond us, this heaven. Plato has this idea of a soul, that what we are supposed to do is eventually escape the cave and leave it to go to the more real world, right? That's our soul leaving and going to the more real world, because... In the real world, there is no physical substance body. It's the world of reason, the world of the intellect. Can you see how the story of Plato's 
is infused within lots of Christian theology. Remember we talked about uh, in the first lecture how you know the New Testament was written in Greek. A lot of a lot of the ideas and interpretations of you know New Testament writings were influenced by Greek philosophy. So can you see how that's related here? So you know, obviously, philosophers are meant to question. Whether you believe philosophers are also meant to be leaders of nations, I don't know. It's up to you to decide. But it's very obvious, isn't it, that philosophers are meant to question fundamental assumptions that most people take for granted. And in our class, we will take a look at five major questions that many of us take for granted. One, oops, as I lighten my face. One, what if anything is real? A lot of us take this for granted, as we saw with the butterfly dream. Two, who am I? What am I? Many of us take that for granted. Three, how do I know anything? What can be known? Are there some things that we just can't know? Four, do I have freedom of choice? Meaning, I feel like I can choose what to do. But as we looked at with Freud, and the whole idea of conditioning, is that necessarily true? Do I have, do you have, does anything have free will? And then five, if choice does exist, how should you choose to live your life? What is the right thing for you to do on a moment-to-moment -moment basis? What's the right thing for you to do in general in terms of what you should want out of life? These are the five major questions that we'll take a look at in our class. This is how you will be a philosopher for the next several weeks by taking a look at these questions and more. So what does that look like? What does it look like to be a philosopher? Again, hopefully as you've gone through this lecture, you get a sense of what it looks like. We'll take a close look at what that looks like by seeing how Rene Descartes, again, does this whole philosophy thing in our next reading.